following week is Parashat Kitaseh, but we'll do a little bit of Parashat Kitaseh and Kitavo. We, we need to go ahead because of Rosh Hashanah, we, it's going to come out uh, better like this, yeah. Unless we see we're running out of time, because Parashat Kitaseh, I believe, has the most mitzvot on any, of any Parashat. There's 74 mitzvot in this Parashat. So there's quite a bit of information, and I'm just going to call over the main points. The very first point appears in the very first pasuk of the, of the parasha, one of the most difficult um, chapters in the whole Torah. The Torah commands us something which is very, very strange. The Torah tells us, When you go out to do war on your enemy, and you defeat him, you will take, captive, you will take the, the enemy captive, and you will see among those who are prisoners Eshet Yifat Tohar a beautiful woman Vehashaktaba you will desire her Vilakakta Lecha Leisha you can take her for your wife on condition that you do the following it's not going to say you just can't grab her and do what you want to do Vavetah El Toch Betecha you should bring her into your home Vigildecha Et Rosha she should shave her head first Vehastat Sipornea she should let her nails grow the Sirat Simlat Shivya Me'alea, she should remove the dress that she was wearing, the beautiful dress that she had when you captured her. The Ashra Be'otecha, she should sit in your home. Vachtai Tavia, she should cry for her family. Yerach Hamim, for a month. V'charken Tavo Aleha, Aleha, then you could go ahead and be with her. V'alta, V'ayta Lecha Lecha and marry her. V'ayayim L'chafat Saba, if you don't want her, then the Shilachta Lecha will go ahead and send her off. Machor Lotim Kerena, you cannot sell her treated as a slave. Go ahead and send her off. Very, very strange mitzvah. Torah is telling us to conduct ourselves in a way which is incompatible with what the Torah has been teaching us all along, not to have anything to do with goyim. <laughs> here there are several problems. There's a problem here with marrying a goya, a non-Jewish girl. There's a problem here that the Torah stresses that obviously there is passion involved. In this case, there is passion. The desire, which the Torah is against. Nevertheless, the Torah says, go ahead, and if you really want it, go ahead and do it in this particular situation where you are going out to war only. What happens at war? What do we hear from many, many wars and battles? That the soldiers rape women, right? What, what's going on? War is, is a very, very unique situation where there is danger. And there's a certain degree of freedom, in a sense, right? Because you have arms and you feel you can do anything you want. And people become wild. We become savage. And here the Torah is telling us that in the midst of this war, go ahead and take a woman. A very difficult uh, chapter. And everybody that learns it has a difficult time with it, unless you learn the commentaries. If you read it at face value, you're going to have a, you're going to have difficulties. That is the problem that many, many people have when they learn Torah or they hear a speech. They have questions and they don't seek the answers and they're troubled. If you have a question, that's okay. Go ahead and find out an answer, a good answer. There's an answer to every question. This is, of course, a a chapter that requires a lot of explanation. If you read it at face value, just read the Pesukim, you're going to have trouble with it. How does the Torah command us to do something against the spirit of Torah, to take a Goya, to let yourself, uh, no, to let yourself uh, be controlled by your passions, Torah is, is against all of this. The commentators explain that this is obviously only talking about a milchemet reshut. A milchemet reshut means that this is not a milchemet mitzvah. It's not a war. It's not a war of mitzvah that we have to remove the enemy from our midst, like the milchama against the seven nations when we went ahead and conquered Israel. It's not a milchemet amal against Amalek that we have to destroy all of them. We don't take captives. It's not a milhamet mitzvah where we are defending ourselves. It's a milhamet reshut. means that we are on the offensive to expand our borders or for other similar reasons. Only in this situation is there this type of conduct. Now, we know that the Torah does not only tell us stories. The Torah is not only a, a book of mitzvot, of commandments. It's definitely a manual how to live one's life. And in the manual, there are instructions. And amongst the instructions, there's also good advice. The Torah is telling us that this is not an ordinary war. We're not just talking about a physical war. The Torah is telling us, when you go out to war, you should know that the most difficult war a human being has during his entire lifetime 
is not war with his enemy or with his neighbor or with city hall. These may be battles too. The biggest and the most difficult battle that one has from the day he's born until the day he dies is the Milhama with the Yetzirah, with the evil inclination. It's always after him. It ambushes, it attempts to ambush one, and it's very difficult to completely defeat him, to subdue him. That is the Milhama, that is one of the Milhama that the Torah is discussing over here. And this ties in with the advice that the Torah appears to give us on how to deal with this Yetzirah. Torah tells us, you know what? During this time of war, the physical war, you may lose control. Just like I just said, many soldiers lose control. They become savages, right? And they do all sorts of things they would not ordinarily do in a civilized society at home. They lose control, and they become infatuated with women. Rabbis tell us that there are many Yitzharim, there are various, quite a few evil inclinations. There is the evil inclination or the desire for women. There is the desire for money. There's a desire for honor. Some people have one, some people have the other, and some have all of the above, unfortunately. That's terrible. I feel bad for them. Because they have many, many wars to deal with, and many frustrations and disappointments if they don't get what they want. The most, One of the most difficult wars to battle is the, is the Yetzir of Arayot, of immorality, of women. That's a very difficult war, and that is why the rabbis encourage Jewish men to get married when they're young. Just for this reason alone. So you save yourself several years of battle. But for, if a boy gets married at 29, we're happy for him, right? But he had 11 years from the point he became 18, which is as the rabbis considered a mature age, right? His 11 years have transpired of doing battle, depending on where he lives, especially if he lives in the city of angels. Everybody here is an angel in the city, right? In the city of angels, it's many, many battles on a daily basis. Some neighborhoods more battle than others. What is this young boy who has money, right, has money, mm. going to do at night after work mm. if he's single? So many temptations. All these temptations are challenges. Your battle. And other people have other challenges. But I'll discuss this here, this important challenge, because this is the most one of the most serious challenges. See, if a person, an individual, is a, is a crook, he has a desire for money to cheat people. That's a terrible thing, right? But that is a problem of human relations. He's basically conducting himself in a corrupt way against his fellow Jew. Immorality has certain dangers that Gesel does not have. Immorality has in it the danger of removing a Jew away from the Creator altogether. Because a Jew, imagine, who gets caught up with a woman who's not Jewish. So if she's Jewish, then it's it's also a problem if he doesn't get married to her. But if she's not Jewish, then there is a danger, okay, he likes her. Maybe he wants to assimilate and convert to her religion, to her faith. And let's say he doesn't do that. Let's say he holds himself back. He's strong in his faith. But his kids are going to be not Jewish. Because the mother is not Jewish. At the end, he's important. Right. And the, woman, and the woman is so powerful that if unless the man is more powerful than her, she'll drag him. Right? As has happened to the most physically strongest person, Shimshon. Shimshon, Shimshon, right? And the, everything that's been recorded in the prophets, everything that's recorded in the Torah is for good reason, because these things have happened in the past, and they've happened to the wisest man in the whole world, Shlomo Amelech. What does Shlomo Amelech say? It says in the Torah, the king should not have many women. Shlomo Amelech says, yes, that was meant for the average person. I'm smarter, I'll control myself. I won't let those women get to me. <laughs> I mean, after all, I know, I know them. It didn't help. Because if you really like someone, what's the problem with them? Not because they're more, they're, they're going to boss you around. If you like them, you'll want to do anything they want. Is that true, Isaac? Yeah. yeah. Is that how it works? Sure. Yeah. You let it go. Yeah. You said you fight. Like, Absalom and his father. Yeah, sure. David and Mary. Yeah, sure. A boy, not a woman. Yeah. Imagine a woman. Sure, sure. So the Torah tells us, listen, sure. we're going to give you, a, we, the Torah says, I'm going to give you a piece of advice. I'm going to let you take this woman. And the idea of behind this, the reason why Torah is giving us permission to do something which is very strange, is only for the purpose of controlling the past. And the Torah tells us how to do it. First, you can't, you can't marry her yet. Bring her into her house, you have to wait a month. During this month, she's going to make herself ugly in your eyes. She's going to make herself ugly in your eyes. She's going to shave her head. 
Yeah. She's going to let her nails grow. She's going to remove her beautiful clothing. You should see her the way she really is without her beauty. You still love her? You still oh, like her? Is the passion still there? In the meantime, the month has gone by. You've had time to cool off. The passion comes and goes. It's not real. A man who marries a woman because of passion, oy va voy. After a while, when he gets old, the passion is gone. Or he marries her for the beauty, and her beauty is gone with all the pregnancies of his old age. There is no foundation to hold the marriage together. It's going to break apart. The Torah is against, the rabbis are against marrying someone for their beauty or because of passion. Because you're physic, passion meaning you're physically attracted. In love. They fall in love and they really fall. Well, and they're, oh, they're, 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 yeah. <laughs> they're exactly. out of love. Exactly. Okay? Torah is against that. You don't marry a woman because of her beauty, because of her money, because you're physically attracted to her. Marry a woman because of her good nature. You have to be physically attracted too. Obviously, you're not marrying it. Just an individual. You're marrying somebody that you feel good with. There's chemistry. You're physically attracted. But the character, the nature is good. This is one you want to get, transmit to your children. She has good character. She comes from a good family. You, she has similar outlook, similar way of looking at life as you do. As best, as close as possible. This makes sense. This can make a good partnership and a good friendship. Both. You need both. Not, you just don't, don't want to share the same room. That's partnership. You want to, of course, share the same house, but you also want to be best friends. You want to be good friends. You want to be good parents to the children. So you want to be a team. In order to be a good team, you have to have similar thoughts. No, this one thinks this way, this one thinks this way. This one wants a Christmas tree, this one wants a Hanukkah. Right? A lot of the time when you have mixed marriages, you have trouble because each one has different ideas. Now, there have been, of course, there are some unique situations where the non-Jew whether it's the man or the woman, honestly and sincerely convert. Not because of the love, because they love this religion. They want to be a Jew. That's different, but that's an, an exception. That's not the rule. The rule is usually people want to, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll convert just to make you happy. No, that's not a good convert. So the Torah is telling us advice on how to deal with the situation when we're at war, the man loses control. We're going to give you instructions on how to deal with this passion that you have. You're going to, we're going to allow you to take her. And we're going to see if, you, if it's still there. Obviously, if it's still there, if you still love it, you're still interested, then of course you have to go through the whole procedure of becoming a Jewess. In the meantime, the Torah allows certain things, but the idea of, of, of giving us permission is with the simple goal of controlling one's Yesera. The Torah knows human nature, and the Torah says if we don't allow it in this way, he's going to do it in a prohibited way. We're going to allow it to the back door, but we're going to give him direction, and we're going to see what happens. Now, if in fact he stays with her, and they have children, mm -hmm. those children are going to be normal, the next sukin deal with Ben Sorero More, which we're not going to get into right now, a rebellious child, if it's true. Ben Sorero means rebellious, a rebellious child. You ever wonder why children are rebellious? Well, there are, there are several reasons. A lot has to do with, of course, the thoughts of the mother and father during the time that they're intimately together. Obviously, it has to do with what neshama, what soul enters that boy. But a great deal of the character of the individual, despite the fact that he has free will, a great deal of the character of, of how we find it is, has to do with the parents. If the husband forces his wife to be with him, and she's asleep and tired, it's not right. It's against the halakha for a husband to impose on his wife he wants to be with her. She's tired. It has to be mutual. It has to come out of love that the two are that the two want to be together. If one is not, a, it does not want it. That if there's a child born from that relationship, it's not going to be a very good child. But the other way, I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about emotionally and mentally. That child might be rebellious, might be, might be a problem child. The child is affected, and very much uh, influenced by the thoughts, the feelings. And the behavior of the parents during the time that they are together. Yeah, it's the other way around. The one that if she wants. Oh yeah, exactly. If the woman in any way shows by hinting, she's not. She, the woman should never ask openly, because that shows that she's a very uh, immodest woman. Yeah, almost immodest. A woman should be very tactful in requesting from her husband for attention, for attention. So the women who knows, so some women know how to do it better than others. Right. So a yeah. man has to be sensitive to pick up the hint, as you say in English. Yeah, but right? if pick up the hint. And if, she, and if she gives him the hint and he refuses, he has an avira. Mm -hmm. He has a sin. How come he's one word? It's not. 
Yeah. 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 She, I, oh. I, all I said is he cannot force her. Ah, she's doing that. So she, she is, of course, doing a terrible thing because that husband, if he does not oh, get okay, yeah. what he really might need at that moment, he might do a terrible. He might go. That's he right. he yeah, might go too. next door to the neighbor. Right. right? Yeah. yeah. These things so happen too. Yeah. So she's not. She has to be very careful. Oh, okay. so I just said that the husband cannot impose his will oh, on his okay. wife. Okay. That's like a rape. Yeah. He cannot right. force her. I mean, obviously, she, she obviously, when, it, when she sees the husband once, she should agree the same way that he has to agree. She's better for, his, for, the, for the good of the family. Because we say, if there's any time a problem between husband and wife in this area, that tears apart the, the whole relationship, especially when they're young. <coughs> okay? Yeah. okay, so the Torah is telling us how to control one's uh, passion, and that this passion itself is not healthy, because eventually if you stay with it, and you stay with this woman who you married as a result of passion, is a child who is a Ben Sorer More. It can be that the child will be a rebellious child. Torah therefore tells us that this Milchama is in Mohammed Yetzer. We're dealing with a war against the Yetzer. And how do you win this war? Kitetse. You have to go on the offensive. Remember the Six Day War? Of yeah. course, the Six Day War in Israel was a miracle. Ashkenaz Bahu helped us. But, they ha- but if we look at it with a non Jewish mind, what happened there? The Jewish nation went on the offensive. They did not wait for them, for the Arabs to attack. They went first and destroyed the Air Force. Preemptive, Pre-emptive strike. Exactly. <coughs> when it comes to the Yetzirah, you, you'll never be on the defensive because you will lose. Always be on the offensive. What does that mean to be on the defensive? You're going to watch all the pornographic movies in the world. going to do, going to watch, allow my eyes to absorb all this junk and garbage, and then I'm going to control myself. No, wait. You can't. Once you allow the, the bear to enter your house, he's going to mess up the house. You're going to throw him out now? You're going to have a hard time. Yeah. He's more powerful than you are. Don't let him in the door. Keep him out. Right? We say it in the Kriyat Shema. We repeat it several times a day. Don't go after your eyes and after what your heart desires. This is very difficult to do, especially in the city of angels. Understand? Very difficult to do. So I'll, I'll tell you what one can do. To, to avoid those problems. Nevertheless, the Torah is giving us advice number one, be on the offensive. Don't look for trouble. And you know what? The Torah says, if you go on the offensive, you will be able to defeat him. But the Torah says, don't think that you defeated him. And that's the end of your troubles with the Yetzer. You have to keep him a prisoner. You have to keep the Yetzer on, on the guard. He's going to come back the next morning. You can't say, Ah, Baruch Hashem, today I didn't do anything. I had an opportunity to do a sin. I held myself back. That's a big thing, by the way. He gets, he gets a lot of credit. But don't think that tomorrow is going to be the same. Every day is different. The Shavita Shivyo hold the Yetzer down. Don't think that you won today, you're going to win tomorrow. Yeah. You can come back even at the age of 65. Even though you say, Oh, the Yetzer for sure is gone. It doesn't interest me like it used to interest me when I was 25. You'd be surprised. You never know. Before you, more. You, you don't. It's true that you don't have the exact same interest when one is older, but until the end, until the very end, a person should never feel too confident, overconfident, that the Yetzer is not going to bother him. The Shavita Shivyo, keep him under guard. Yeah. There is a soldier who goes to war. Yeah. He does the things that he, that, that he, you know, the passion and all that. Yeah. Uh, it's also because he feels that he might not come back from the war. He might die. Right, that could be, but that's a non-Jewish yeah. All right. The, the rabbis tell us that this Yetzer is called Melech Kesil, a king who is a fool. Why do they call him a king that he's a fool? I'm sorry, Melech Zaken, Uksil. He's an old king and a fool. Why an old king and a fool? Because he's there from age one, age zero, from the very start. Yet said at all, the good inclination only comes at the bar mitzvah. When we become bar mitzvah, Kadosh Baruch Hu gives us the maturity and the ability to be able to reason. So at that point arrives something called Yet said to, which is a good positive inclination, or good angel as it's called. And now we're able to reason. When we see a situation, should I do this or should I do that? child until the age of 13 does not have that ability to distinguish between right and wrong. 
So what does he have? Only the Yetzirara. The only, only the Yetzirara, and that is why children want everything for themselves. They're always fighting. Because they're, and they're selfish usually, because all they have is Yetzirara. Yetzirara is there from Melech Zakin. He's been around from the very beginning. Yetzirara Tov is a young king. He comes later on. So the Melech Zakin has been there longer. He's 13 years older, right? So he, you know, it's harder to defeat him. But he's also called a kid. He's also called a fool. What does that tell us? The rabbis mean, meant to tell us that just because he's been around for a while doesn't mean that he has control over you. He's a fool. What does it mean, a fool? You can defeat him. You can trick him. As the Pasuk says, When you do war, you have to do it through trickery. Right? You don't disclose the time you're going to invade. Huh? Right? B'tachmulot. You have to find, exactly, strategy. With the you have to use strategy. You have to use strategy. They asked once a big rabbi, okay, you're a big tzaddik, you're so righteous right now, we understand that you don't sin, but how did you do that when you were so, when you were a young boy? How did you convince or discourage the Yetzirah from, uh, from bothering you? You were a young boy, where did you take the strength and intelligence? Now we understand, what did you do then? So the rabbi said, this is what I told the Yetzirah whenever he approached me when I was a boy. This is a halakha, according to Jewish law, if you are a judge, and somebody approaches you with a case, he wants to sue his neighbor. You cannot listen to him until you hear both at the same time. So you shouldn't form an opinion. He comes to you and says, I'm sorry, I can't listen to you unless you're both there together. That's the halakha. You cannot listen to one without the other one being present. So the rabbi says, whenever the Yesara came to me when I was a young boy, I would always tell him, I can't listen to you until I hear the Yesara talk what he has to say. So you're going to have to wear until I'm bar mitzvah before you bother me. And the idea is you have to you have to find ways of tricking the Yetzirah. And it's not easy, but it can be done. That is what the rabbis tell us. Yetzirah will not wait. It's 13 years. Right. Yeah, I'm here now. Right. Right? Okay. The Yetzirah tells people, you know how he convinces people? So the Yetzirah told is going to promise you that you're going to be rewarded in Olam Abba, right, in the world to come. I reward you now, I pay cash. I don't pay with a post-dated check, like the Yetzirah told. So you're right, the Yetzirah has a tremendous amount of influence. So what do we do? Okay, so now the question is, so what do we do since the Yetzirah has a tremendous amount of influence? We said about the Shavita Shavio that you have to keep him under control. How do you keep him under control the whole time? So the Rabbis tell us, Allah HaKadosh Baruch the Almighty said, I created the Yetzirah for a reason. Otherwise you would all be puppets. I gave you free will, you are able to distinguish between right and good. I gave you a second, a very powerful mind that animals don't even have. And you have a neshama, which is a part of me, a soul. You are capable of choosing between right and wrong, between good and evil. However, you, you may have a difficult time, because this Yetzirah that I created is a very powerful enemy. So, true, I created the Yetzirah, but I also created for him an antidote. An antidote means medication. Yeah. To, to heal it, to neutralize it. And what is that? The Torah. A person who sits down and learns Torah, uh, instead of listening to the news, instead of looking in the internet, instead of going and playing cards, uh, instead of going and doing some, uh, something else, he learns Torah for an hour, half an hour even, even 15 minutes, that recharges his spiritual batteries. That gives him the strength to fight the Yisrael. Because the Torah, it is known, cools a person's passion. If a, if, if a Jew learns Torah, he becomes tired, actually. It actually wears him out, especially if he, if he, if he, if he delves deeply into it. He starts asking questions, he starts analyzing, he sees the beauty of it. So first of all, he neutralizes the Yetzer. How? By cooling off the passion. By, number two, by being Messiah Haddad. Messiah Haddad means that he's able to push aside all the thoughts, the bad thoughts that he may have had before, because he's occupied doing something else. Right? And besides that, a Torah also gives him simha. Because one of the greatest yetzarim in the world is depression. Sadness. That's also yetzar. Yeah. A person who's sad and depressed, why should a person be sad? A Torah who loves him, gave him exactly what he needs, takes care of him. But a person who's sad, he says, my neighbor has more than me, I'm struggling, I'm working so hard, my wife doesn't like me. There are many reasons for a person to be disappointed and sad and depressed. Many, many reasons during the day. Some days worse than others. That's all yet, sir. 
If a person sits down and learns Torah and he sees what life is all about, this is a temporary world. For some of us, it will last for 65 years, for others for 75 years, and some who are lucky to 99 years, right? But it's a temporary world. What am I going to get upset for something temporary? The amor is going to pass by, you know. And there, and there are other there are other ways of looking at situation. If a person does not learn Torah, he's got a lot of trouble. There will not be any way for him to understand or to be able to cope with the many challenges and demands that life has. There are many challenges and demands. Imagine a, a child comes and asks you for money. All right? And you know that he's going to use that money to buy drugs. What are you going to do? No. What? No money. You love the child. You want to help him out. No. All right? It's a difficult situation. I gave you this example not because I'm about to give you a solution for that. I gave you this example just to give you, to show you what kind of problems people can have. It's a major problem. The child that came from you, that you love, that you want to give everything you own to him, you see that he's deteriorating in front of your eyes. And you, if this child is not connected to the Torah, if the father is not connected to rabbis or to the Torah, he's going to be completely lost. He's going to go to a psychologist, he's going to go rob him more money. Right? This is a major problem. A teenager who's drifting. It's a problem. I'll just give you one example of a problem. One who's not connected to Torah, he's going to be depressed, he's going to be sad, he's not going to know how to deal with problems correctly. So Torah says for all the Yitzharim, the best advice of controlling them is Barati lo Torah taplin. I've created an antidote, and this is the best antidote. The Barat goes on to say, what happens if this antidote does not help? Yes, it's possible. This guy is crazy. He has all these terrible thoughts in his mind the whole day. It bothers him even if he goes into the Beth Midrash. The rabbis give us more ideas. They tell us, reach a mindset. If nothing helps, what do they tell us? Remind him the Yom HaMavit. Remind the Yetzer the day of death. In other words, when a person starts thinking, I'm going to die, and sooner or later they're going to put me a few feet under, right? And they're going to cover my body with shrouds, and the worms are going to start eating me. And what's going to be left of all this money and all of this shtuyot and all of this nonsense that I'm pursuing now? Nothing. I'm not taking it with me. These thoughts and ideas, as sad as they may be, and as depressing as they may sound, they humble a person's heart. They humble him. Oh, no. Sooner or later, I'm going to be just like that guy who's in the who's in a casket right now. In that, what, what do you call that car? The funeral car? Where's, where's, uh, where's, uh, where's, where's, yes. Where's, 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 Sooner or later, I'm going to be there. That is exactly why Kohelet tells us, We're always better off if you have a choice between going to a party or going to a house of mourning. Go to the house of mourning. Not only is it a mitzvah, those who are still alive will be able to reflect. Oh, this guy passed away. What did he pass away from? What's the difference? Everybody passes yeah, away the end. Money, yeah. uh, People always want to know what he passed away from. Like that was the reason that he passed away. The reason he passed away, most of the cases, is because the angel of death came and the time arrived for him to take the Neshama. So what did he die of? Obviously, people die from different things. It makes no difference. The time has come and that's it. When a per- person goes to a house of mourning, he's able to reflect. You mean to say, this is where I'm going to? Yes. But he wasn't thinking about that. He was thinking about his stocks. He was thinking about his next vacation. Maybe he was thinking about his mistress, if he had one, right? Right. Maybe he was thinking about a cruise, right? Maybe he was thinking about some other studio, the remodeling of his home that he has, that he wants to, that he's excited about doing. He has to go choose right now what kind of tile or what kind of a countertop. How much of a back backsplash? Yeah, yeah. And, and how thick should the grout be? This is what people are thinking about that. And, and instead of reflecting, that sooner or later they're going to be in a casket. They, they lose themselves. They don't know. That's why if a, why a Jew is connected to Torah, sooner or later he comes across these ideas. He's exposed to the realities. And he's not brainwashed, and he's not misled, and he's not blinded. He knows, this is how much time I have been given to live my life. God gave me an opportunity to do my utmost. He has given me the potential. I have hands and feet. I should be happy. There are some people who don't have hands and feet. Some people who are sick and invalid in the hospital. Some people who have Alzheimer's, I'm still healthy, I still have eyes to see, and I can still walk with you. On my own, I'm able to perform. Right? How is a person going to think of that? Which politician in Congress tell me, whether in the Senate or in the House, 
thinks about these ideas. No, no. They're thinking about their position. How? What should I do to get reelected? Re That's all a yeah. goy thinks yeah, about. Get the money for what does a goy think funds? about? Yeah, yeah, campaign funds, yeah. right? That's a, a goy's life is empty. Does he yeah, think? Does he reflect the, uh, about? The does he reflect the, about the life and death? Yeah. I see at work sometimes they pass around cards of condolences, and I like to see what each one wrote. We empathize with you. We sympathize. We share in your loss. Yes, to you. You know what, what are they going to say? They don't even know. No, they don't even know the, the significance of that. What does it mean that the person is no longer here? <coughs> that is the importance of being attached to the Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The rabbis tell us that in, in the way a person wants to go, that is the way they lead him. They won't stop a person if he wants to commit a crime. But a person who wants to do good, who wants to be clean, they will help him out. So therefore, a Jew who wants to protect himself from the Yetzirah, who wants to avoid all the pitfalls in life, and honestly and sincerely asks Hashem for help, Hashem will help him. But if he, does, if he avoids the help, he says, I can handle it on my own, nothing will happen to me, he's going to fall. So one should be extremely careful when it comes to those areas that are dangerous, that the Yetzirah is there, and not rely on his intelligence, on his self-control. But the best thing to do is stay away from there. Okay, let's go to the next point. Next point is the Torah commands us not to marry Ammon and Moab, the male members of the nations of Ammon and Moab. They should never come, they should never marry. We cannot marry the male members of the nations of Ammon and Moab. Ever since Sanherib, the Syrian king, came to the world, he mixed everybody up. He took people from here and put them there, people from here and put them there, moved everybody around. So today, nobody is a pure ethnic. Uh, national of whatever nation he is. The Egyptians today are not the original Egyptians, except yeah. maybe a few Coptics, yeah. maybe, right? Uh, Iran is mixed with all sorts of nations too. Babylonia is mixed with all sorts of nations. And the Palestinians are definitely not original inhabitants of that land. Many of them, of the Palestinians, especially from Gaza, came from Egypt. Egypt? Yeah. Right. So we don't really have today a true Amon and Moab, even though the area of Amon and Moab is in Jordan. Anyway, the Torah is telling us. You cannot marry certain people. Amon and Moab being some of them, the male only, not the female. Why not? So the Torah explains. For two reasons. One, they did not come out willing to help you when you needed their help. The food and the drink when you were in the desert on your way to Israel. And because they hired Bil'am to curse you. The Torah punishes them. They can never be members of the Jewish nation. They cannot convert. They cannot join us. Only the male, because the males were the ones that that were that had the ability to help, not the women. So the women, Ruth, is a Moaviyah. She, of course, is allowed to convert, but not the male. What's going on over here? What What did they do so bad? The Egyptians killed us. They enslaved us, and we don't have. They don't have that kind of prohibition. On the contrary, if you read on a little bit later, it says Loteta Domi Edom. You shouldn't detest. He's your brother. You should not detest an Egyptian. You are an inhabitant in his land. They enslaved us. They butchered us. They threw us into the Nile. And only Ammon and Moab. Ammon and Moab have something which is more dangerous than what the Egyptians say. The Egyptians perhaps killed us physically. Ammon and Moab had, have a terrible midah, a terrible characteristic called kriyutovah being ungrateful. Abraham Avinu, our great-grandfather, helped their great-grandfather. Lot. Where is their gratefulness? Where is their acknowledgement? We're somewhat related. Where is the decency? Because they had no decency, because they were Puyetova, ungrateful. We don't want these kind of people mixing in our blood. See, when a Jew and a non-Jew marry, there's several problems. It's not only the problem of combining two neshamot from different camps, one from Tara and one from Tum'ah. It's not only philosophical problems in the future. It's also a problem of mixing the blood of one who has, perhaps, terrible traits in their genes. Do you know what certain people eat? 
certain nations, all the shkatsim remasim, all the reptiles you can think of, anything that crawls, they eat it. No, in certain nations. And you want to bear a child with that person? Think of it for a moment. The blood carries with it a lot of genes. A lot is transferred over to the children, and it stays there. Hashem says, I don't want this. Remember Yaakov? Yaakov went and married who? From the daughters of Laban. How, do he, how does he go marry the daughters of the biggest crook that ever lived Ooh. in history? Laban Arami. Family. The family was a family of crooks and idol worshippers. <coughs> Why did he go there? Because the daughters of Laban were not like the daughters of Canaan, the neighbors. They were noble. They were excellent and, and strong in the area of Ahnasat of Shem and Hesed, in kindness. Their father was an idol worshiper. That's in the mind, not in the heart. You can change the mind. The daughter doesn't have to have the same mindset as her father. Right. He was an idol worshiper. Let him be so. I don't have to agree with him. Right? The main thing that they were looking for, the family of Yitzhak, Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, was Hesed. Good character, good natured people. Things that will go over to the kids. And we have that nature. The rabbis tell us, any Jew that you see that is lacking in its totality, completely, by Shanut, Rahmanut, or Milut Chasadim, any one of these three traits, compassion, bashfulness, and righteousness, and, uh, and kindness, I mean, <coughs> right? Any one of these three, if he's missing them in its totality, you may rightfully suspect that he has non-Jewish blood mixed in him. You may rightfully suspect, because a Jew has all these three in various degrees. So Hashem says these people are persona non grata. Mm -hmm. They're unwanted in the not Jewish accepted. nation. Not accepted. Why does the Torah give us a second explanation? Because they hired Bilam. Hired Bilam actually should have been the first explanation. To curse the Jewish people? The second explanation is given to us for a very good reason. And you will understand it through the following story. There was once a father who all he wanted for his only daughter was that she marry a successful businessman, a rich boy. He didn't care about the boy being a yeshiva boy, Talmud Chacham, Torah, that's unimportant to him. And many people have this attitude today too. I want him to be a professional, I want him to make money, that's it, that's all he said. The daughter was a good girl. She came home one day with a yeshiva boy. Daddy, he's the one that I, I want to marry. How is he going to support you? I'm going to work, Baruch Hashem, Hashem, and if you can help out occasionally, we will be very grateful to you. There's no way in the world. I'm against this marriage. I will work against it, do anything I can to, right. to to prevent it, and I will definitely not support you. Anyway, and he kept his word. He didn't support me. One day he hears that they're living in poverty. He was very happy. Now is my chance to convince my daughter to let go of this man. She wouldn't give up. This is the man she loved, and despite the fact that they were living in poverty, she was not going to listen to her father. The father sees that nothing helps. So he decides to go to a, a suit Sayer. A soothsayer is like a magician. He casts spells. Voodoo, shmoodoo, all these things, right? right? And he paid him a lot of money. And he cast a spell on my son-in-law. Yeah, of course. Yeah, of course it is. There's all sorts of things. Cast a spell on him. and gave him a large amount of money. The rabbi in the community heard about this and approached the father. How could you do this to your daughter? How, how could you not support her? You see them living in poverty. She's your only daughter. How could you let this happen? So the father wanted to defend himself and says, I don't have enough money to support my family or support her family. He says, don't give me that kind of an answer. You know that that's baloney. You had enough money to go hire a soothsayer to cast a spell on your son. Like for that, you do have money? Well, you could have invested that in your, in, the, in your daughter. Wouldn't have that been a better investment for your money? The Tarag Dosha says the same thing. Amon Moab, how could you not have the decency of helping out your relatives with food and drink. We couldn't afford it! Yeah, but you had all the money to go hire Bil'am. You see? So the Torah uses a second idea to basically yeah. give it to them. And, so, and don't say, don't come up with any silly excuse. You didn't have the ability. You couldn't afford it. Bil like Bil a lot of people do. Right? And Bil would have cost them more. Sure, more. sure, sure. They were willing to give them anything, just curse them. For that, you do have money. So don't give us that excuse. You were ungrateful. Okay. There are quite a few mitzvot in Pashat Kitetzeh, and I'm just going to tell you what they have in common. 
Several of them are as follows. We have the mitzvah of lotah roshor v'chamor, Roshat Yitzhak say, not to have a, an ox and a donkey plowing together. We have the mitzvah of shiluach haken, sending up the mother bird before taking the, the chicks. We have the mitzvah of, of not charging interest on, on loans. We have the mitzvah of yibum, meaning if a, if a woman uh, a woman, a woman's husband passes away and they had no children together. It is a mitzvah on the brother of the deceased husband to marry that wife, so that the child that is born uh, be ra- be named after the, the original husband. That's so we have that mitzvah in this parasha. We have the mitzvah of paying an employee on time, paying an employee on time. We have the mitzvot of leket shecha upea which says if, if you're in the agricultural business and you have a field, is to leave portions, various portions to the poor, various portions of the field or of the crop. And we also have a mitzvah of mitziyat avida. If you find a lost object, returning the lost object to its rightful owner. These are, these are many, there are many mitzvot. These mitzvot, what they have in common, if you want to know what they have in common, is that the Torah wants to instill in us mitzvah para When Hashem gives us a mitzvah, you think He needs it? What does Hashem gain? If you find a lost object, the street, you turn it. You did a very nice thing. We're not doing it for Him. Hashem says, all these mitzvot, you're doing it for yourself. By doing these mitzvot, you know what you will be doing to yourself? What you will gain from it? Besides the reward, you will be instilling in yourself midat arachamim. All of these things, in other words, ashor v'achamor, they can't pull together. Each one works at a different pace. There are other reasons according to the Kabbalah for every mitzvah. But the basic understanding is that these mitzvot would have in common not charging repeat, not charging interest. You want to help somebody when you want to give him a loan? How would you charge him interest? When you, when a person charges interest on the loan, he's helping himself, not helping the other person. Who is he really helping? Unless it's a business loan, there's a way to do it with the heteri scott, right? Paying an employee on time. All of these things, if a person, if a Jew is sensitive to these mitzvot, and he does them, he fulfills them, he instills in himself midat rachamim. Because that's what all these have in common. Careful with paying on time, not charging interest, uh, leaving portions of the crop to the poor, returning a lost object. Yeah. You know what? This guy who lost it, how happy he will be if you return it to him? Mm-hmm. If you can, obviously, if you can identify it. All of these, what they have in common is rahamim, to an extent. When, when one does this and is careful with them, and he cares, uh, and he's concerned about these mitzvot, he will become a rahman. This is how we develop. Rahmanot. You don't, you're not just necessarily born with it. Yeah, some people, of course, are, are more sensitive than others by birth. But this is how you develop good character and good nature. You see it by others. You learn it from one, from your parents. Mm-hmm. And you learn it in Torah. And you end by doing the mitzvot. All right. Real quickly, Bashat Kitavo. In Bashat Kitavo, we see the mitzvah of Bikurim. The mitzvah, of Bikurim, which is next week. The mitzvah of Bikurim is bringing from the first fruit that grow to the Kohen, to the Beit HaMikdash. What was the idea of bringing from the first fruit? The very first fruit. You want it, you're want you excited, you want to eat it for yourself, you want to try it out. The says, wait, control yourself. Control your ta'ava, control your desire. The first fruit you're going to bring to Hashem. Why? Not only to control your desire, but also to say thank you. People forget to say thank you. Every time we leave the bathroom, we say a very important blessing, a very powerful blessing. And that is a big segula, by the way. It's a good remedy for people who are suffering from all sorts of ailments in the stomach to have in mind to say the Chavanah Gdullah, to say with the tremendous Chavanah, the Bracha Asher Yatsar, when you leave the bathroom. Because they shouldn't take for granted that nature does what it needs to do. No! If it wouldn't be because Hashem controls it, because Hashem said so, people would be stuck, people would have trouble. So the same thing with Bikurim. A person has to know what the source of the blessing is, where it comes from, who gave it to him, who's the boss. So when he takes from the first fruit, brings it to the Bet Amigdash, brings it to the Kohen, says what he says, he's acknowledging the source of the blessing, where it comes from, who gave it to him, and he's saying thank you. And on top of all of that, he's controlling his tava. Right? People want everything for themselves, especially the very first fruit. They'd like to have it, but like to keep it for themselves. So I says, no, you have to share your wealth with others, like it is with Sedaqah. And the same thing with the Bikurim, with the first fruit, the very first, the ones that are your favorite. The ones you want to try first, no, first you bring it to the Beit HaMikdash, bring it to the Kohen, and do what you need to do, and say thank you. Part of the Mitzvah Bikurim was to say a Bidui, 
it's a whole parasha, part, and, and the idea behind that bidui was to bring about humbleness in the person. And once a person will be humble, he will be able to fulfill the pasuk that says the samachta l'tnei Hashem Rokecha is to rejoice with what Hashem gives you. Not everybody rejoices, not everybody is happy. A lot of people want to have more. When a person becomes humble and realizes that, the li- that, that he should be happy with the little bit that he has, that is a tremendous ma'ala. He has reached a tremendous level of bitachon and Hashem. In order to get there, a person has to realize where the source of blessing is. A person has to be humble and he has to get used to appreciating what he has and saying thank you. That will help him develop the simcha of the samachtari of Hashem Elokecha. Part of what he says when he would come to the Beit HaMikdash is Ve'ata hine heveti. The words Ve'ata hine heveti contain three important messages. Ve'ata, the rabbis tell us, is I did it bizrizut. I did it quickly. I wasn't lazy about it. Hine, I did it besimcha. And heveti, I did it without any uh, interest. In other words, any personal gain. I did it l'shem shamayim. And the message, the main message over here is that that is the way every mitzvah should be done, the Shem Shamayim, especially the mitzvah of tzedakah. One of the highest levels of charity is tzedakah v'seter, and one does it anonymously. You don't know who you gave it to, and he does not know who he got it from, because then you don't have a gain, right? There was a, there was a big rabbi in Lodz, the Yao of Lodz. This is the way he used to do chesed. People would come to him and sleep over his house, and as you know, in those days, the roads were not paved. <coughs> it was very muddy in the winter. Snow, mud. So there was one gentleman that came to his house, needed a place to stay. The rabbi gave him a bed. The rabbi himself made the bed. Not him, right? He wanted to have the mitzvah. And the guy was so tired, he went to sleep. As soon as the guy fell asleep, the rabbi noticed that the guy's shoes were torn. Poor man, torn. In those days, you know, he didn't just go to some store on Fairfax and buy yourself a new pairs of shoes. You wore them for a long time, you patched it, you fixed it. Rabbi felt bad for him. He took his own shoes, which happened to be the same size as that person, boots or whatever, replaced them. The man who was in a hurry the next morning to leave put on the new shoes, left immediately, and did not even realize that he had brand new shoes on him. Because as soon as he was in the street, he was back in the mud and the snow, so he couldn't tell the difference. The rabbi was able to do a mitzvah, the Shem Shamayim, Mitzvah Baseter, the Zakah Baseter, without the person ever knowing. Eventually he will find out, but then he will forget who gave it to him. That's the idea, the highest degree of Zakah, when one does it, the Seder. One has to be very careful to do Zakah quickly, because as the story is with Nacham Gamzu, there was once a poor man who asked him for some food, and he asked for a few moments to unload his, his, his bags, and by the time he unloaded everything, the man already died. You have to be careful to do mitzvot bizrizut. A person who doesn't act quickly, there will always be something to interrupt him, to interfere with him. And it, right. And a person has to do it with simcha, not with a, not with a sad face. It's, a, it's an incomplete mitzvah if a person complains about what he's doing. Oh, this is so difficult. Oh, I can't do this. Right? A person has to do it with simcha. You know, obviously, all these things require time. They require a person to develop certain habits and training. It doesn't come easily. But it, it is possible, and Torah tells us this is the correct way to do it. The last point that I want to talk about. Anyway, so Parshat Kitavo, there's a lot of arur, 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 a lot of curses, but there's also berachot. If you do the right things, you will be blessed. But the Torah says, you know what kind of a blessing? They will reach you. What does it mean that they will reach you? The rabbi says, if a person always pursues tzedakah, he wants to do tzedakah. Hashem says, you know what, you really want to do it, I will always make sure that you have the money to do it, mm-hmm. and, that you, and that you give it to the right people, mm-hmm. that you will always be able to fulfill it. There was once such a Jew, I'll tell you a story, and you will understand what I mean. What does it mean, V'yisigucha? There was once a Jew who always used to like to help people. He would, Mamash, give his shirt off his back. He once did not have any money to give anymore. He sold his house. So he should have money to, to be able to continue to help people. Tremendous Bal Chesed. Anyway, right now he's left without any money. So they were living very, very tightly. And his wife tells him, Anoshana Rabbah, you know what? It's a holiday. Anoshana Rabbah, go buy your kids some, something. Make them happy. And she gave him a few pennies. A little bit of money. Go, go make your kids happy. 
And as he's already going out, a mitzvah came to his hands. Mm-hmm. To some orphans need some clothing. He gave all the pennies, all the money that he had for the orphan. How, what am I going to do now? What am I going to bring home to my own little kids? Hoshana Rabbah is one after Sukkot. He goes to the Betak and he sees a whole bunch of Metrogim lying on the floor. People already don't need them anymore. He says, okay, I'm going to bring them some Metrogim. He comes home. He forgot about it because he was going the next day. He was traveling to try out a new business. And he put the bag of Metrogim in his suitcase by mistake. He arrives at this new destination and he finds out that the king is very, very sick. And the only cure is the citron fruit. And he looks in his bag and he sees that, oh, what, is that? what are these Etrogim, the citron, doing in my suitcase? Like, apparently I forgot. He immediately took it to the king. And he, the king got healed from this fruit. You can already imagine how much he was rewarded by the king. That same bag was filled with all the money. And he didn't have to, he didn't have to come on to people's help, people's assistance anymore from that day on. Kalash Bahu rewarded him. He always took the initiative to help people. He went out of his way. Midah keneged midah, the sigucha. Don't worry. Eventually, the blessing will catch up. Will catch up to you. You won't have to look very hard. A lot of people have to work very hard. And Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, who blesses them. One of the greatest berachot we say in Rikat Amazon is what? Shetiye parnasatenu krova la'ir. That our parnasah should be close to home. We shouldn't have to travel an hour in every direction. I should be able to walk to my business, Isaac. Right? Mm-hmm. Just walk. Make a, you don't even walk. You just pick up the phone call and you send the fax and you have a deal. <laughs> this is the best beracha when you don't have to work so hard. That is the sigucha. If a person he takes the initiative, he doesn't wait for the poor man to come to his door. Okay. He goes looking for opportunities to give tzedakah. Mm-hmm. Akadosh Baruch will reward the midah and that the blessing in the same way will come to his door. 